Okay, right off the top, I want to ask you a personal question. Have you ever been wounded when you found out what someone had said about you, uh, which revealed something that they think about you, an opinion they might have about you? Has that ever happened to you? Hurts, doesn't it? Uh, I will join your club if you have one. It's happened to me. In fact, it caused me to get off to a, a little bit of a bumpy start when I went to seminary, which some years ago, 96 is whenever I started in seminary. Um, and I was um, commuting to Emory University in Atlanta. I, I would leave on Monday night and stay down there for three or four nights, depending on the class schedule, in a little room at a house that I rented. And then I would um, I would come back and be husband, father, and pastor of, uh, of the church I was serving on the, the weekend. So it was a busy time. Didn't have a lot of time for campus life. Um, but everyone who comes into Candler School of Theology is put into a small group with roughly 12 people. And you stay with that group for two years. And one of the big things you do together is process what was then called supervised ministry. It's now called contextual education, I think. But everyone who comes in has some sort of ministry post or ministry job that they do anywhere in the greater Atlanta area. Then you come back and process that by offering case studies and, and we do peer review and that sort of thing. And then there's a faculty supervisor. I was a, 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 a while well, I worked at uh, uh, Emory Medical Center as a chaplain. And uh, so we reported on those sorts of things. Um, I was very uncomfortable in those meetings because, you know, you didn't really know these people all that well. Uh, and I struggled with it a little bit, but I did my best. So at the end of the second semester, which was the end of the first year, spring 97, uh, the, the faculty uh, supervisor said, I want everyone to, I'm going to give you a name of a student. You won't know who, they won't know who you are and you don't tell them. And I want you to write down just a few sentences about what you think about that person. And the, the idea was it was supposed to help us with self-awareness and, and help our ministry. So we all got a name and we all did our assignment. We brought it back to the professor and she sort of wrote them up in a standard form so we wouldn't know whose was whose. And then we got the one that had been written about us. And I'll never forget the first two words that I read. Distant stand offish doesn't seem to have a lot of empathy went on to say not involved in community life together could be problematic in ministry now if you could read my uh, heart rate on my watch right now it went up just telling you that story I still feel that tightness in my chest and that sort of limp feeling you feel in your arms and legs like electricity had just gone through you I was so angry when I heard that, I just, you know, I scanned the room and I wanted, we didn't know who had written what, but I wanted to know who it was because I just wanted to confront them and say, distant, it's a standoffish, you don't understand, I am painfully introverted. And walking into a room of people where I don't know anyone is like running a gauntlet with, of machine guns trained at my head. It's hard for me. Not empathetic. I can't barge into your life uninvited. I can't do that unless I know what my role is. It's not that I don't care. I just don't know how to address that. And no, I'm not involved in community life because I'm driving back and forth from Atlanta to Knoxville and, and, it, and, and I just want wanted to say to them, how can you say that about me? You don't understand me. And the worst part about it is I just shut down. I will tell you that I did. I'm not proud of that, but it was a defense mechanism and it negatively impacted the extent that that supervised ministry impacts your learning for the next year. Because I, I really just sort of pulled back because I had to, and it really did impact me some and limit me some in terms of my learning. So let me ask the question again. Have you ever, have you ever been wounded like that? Um, you know, I know there are folks, I've talked to them who bear those sorts of wounds uh, in our church. And it may be something that someone has said recently, or it may be something someone said 30 years ago, five years ago. It may be something that's being said ongoing. And it may be a direct statement someone makes, or it may be some kind of passive aggressive thing, which is usually how it happens. And sometimes it's what people don't say or do instead of what they do that causes us to feel like they think certain things about us and they're not very complimentary. Now, this isn't to 
say that there aren't people out there who pour into our lives and say things that encourage us or give us, you know, tough love and information we need to have that's true to help us grow. That's, that's a different thing. These are opinions that are usually not based on reality that can, that can very much hurt us when we find out about it. And, and here's the problem. Whenever that happens, we withdraw like I did and we fail to engage people or we fail to engage uh, the world around us and, and that's not good. Or, or we, we hear it from someone who has some authority or power in our life and depending on how much power they have in our life, even if it's not true, we can begin to believe it is because we hear it over and over again. That fear of being judged can cause us to be limited in our potential because we're afraid to move. We're afraid that we'll be rejected. We're afraid that someone will think we're a failure. It's, it's tough. And, and I don't want us to live like that. Those factors can live in our soul just out of sight. You know, maybe we push them back because they were so painful, but the pain is still there. And they still work against us and create this drag in our life that can keep us from reaching out as far as we need to reach to become all that we've been called to be. So, so here's the thing. If, you, if that resonates with you, if that's true in your life, even to just some extent, I want to invite you to do something. I want you to entertain the possibility that it doesn't have to be that way. It really doesn't. Now, even if this something, it just impacts you occasionally, it still can limit us. Today, our sermon series, Greater Than, will embrace this idea that we are greater than the opinions of others, particularly opinions that are hurtful, opinions that aren't necessarily rooted in reality, but they're opinions that we hear and they hurt us and limit us. Now, I know that we can't silence all those voices and clear out all the debris of the damage that those voices have caused in one sermon. But if I can just do one thing today, if I can encourage us to listen more closely to Jesus' voice in our life and allow him to start to drown out some of those other voices that can hurt us so much, well, can we just do that? And if we do that, maybe we can take one little piece of that debris that tends to weight us down, and maybe we could just expel that from our soul today and move forward, or at least begin that process. So to do that, I want to make a proposal to you. I want you to think about this statement. Jesus thinks you are greater than what others may think of you, and the cross stands as proof. Jesus didn't die on the cross to let other people direct your life by their misunderstandings and statements that they make or opinions that they have that are hurtful. Jesus went all the way to the cross to prove that he loves you, he believes in you, and wants to see you come to full potential. All the way to the cross. But first, he went all the way to Samaria. And that is a lead in to the Bible story we're going to talk about today. I'm not going to read this whole passage because it comes from John chapter 4 and it's verse 1 through 42 and it takes a long time. And there are probably 10 really good sermons about different topics in that. So, so I just want to focus on one thing. I'm going to pull some, some verses out. But I want us to look at this wonderful passage of Jesus encountering a Samaritan woman at a well and how that changes her life forever. And the truth in this story can also change our lives forever if we'll give it a shot. Now, just the, the, the basic understanding of the story is this enmity between Jews and Samaritans. You know, how much did Jews hate Samaritans? What was the likelihood of them getting together? What's the likelihood of President Trump and Speaker Pelosi going out for a latte? Okay, there's a better chance of that than there would have been for a Jew and a Samaritan to even stand on the same soil in the same country together 2,000 years ago in the days of Jesus. They really, really hated each other. But there's this interesting verse that I want to get to. I'm going to read the first four verses. So this is from uh, 
Luke, uh, John <laughs> chapter 4, and we're going to talk about Luke in a minute. John chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Let me read them. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Here's the big verse. Now he had to go through Samaria. Okay, see that just begs the question, why? Why did he have to go through Samaria? A couple of reasons. One, geographic. If you're in Ju uh, Judea, and Jerusalem was in Judea, that's in the southern part of the area, then to get up to Galilee, which is where Jesus was from, up at the top of the Sea of Galilee, if I remember correctly, to get up there, you had to literally go through Samaria or go across the Jordan River and go all the way up the other side, way out of your way. Now, Jewish people did that just so they didn't have to actually walk on Samaritan soil. Again, it's how much they hated each other. So, there was this this geographic sense in which Jesus had to go to Samaria. But there's a more important sense, I believe, and that is the missional sense. Remember, Jesus first came for the lost sheep of Israel, but the mission soon expanded from that to eventually include every human be being, Gentiles and Jews and everyone, no matter what category we fall into. And so at that time, I think Jesus thought, you know, if I go through Samaria, I'll have an opportunity uh, to really make a point with my disciples who are going to come back and tell others. And I can begin to get our Jewish folk to understand that it's not just about them. It's about even people they hate. That would play into his teaching about loving your enemy, how that's even more important than loving the people that are easy to love. So, so he decides to go through Samaria. And that brings the first point that I want to make today, and that is that whenever we think about these opinions that people have of us, sometimes they can be cultural opinions, opinions shared by a whole culture about another group of people or another culture. Now, no offense, ladies, no offense. I love you all with the love of Christ. But in Jesus' day, it would have been below his station as a rabbi to be in conversation with any woman, let alone um, a Samaritan woman. Rabbis didn't engage in those sorts of conversations, particularly, again, with Samaritan women. But Jesus didn't care about cultural opinions. That, that didn't register with him. It had nothing to do with what he was doing. And maybe it was because the first people Jesus met, besides his mother and stepfather, were, were the shepherds. Who were they? They were culturally excluded. People had all sorts of cultural opinions about the shepherds. They were the first ones to get to the cradle. And then the second ones that he met, the second group of people that he met were the Magi. And these were dark-skinned people from what would be uh, Iran now, probably that area. They were astrologers. And then he went on from there to live in Egypt for a while. So cultural barriers were like paper mache to Jesus. For him, a cultural barrier was like the barriers they draw up, you know, uh, at high school football games. And the team comes roaring through and they, and they tear this big panel uh, that says, go whatever the team is. That's Jesus just blowing through cultural barriers. They meant nothing to him. Wouldn't it be great if that were still the case now? But there are still so many. You know, people of color deal with this all the time. And, and you know, for me, this this is the harder part of this issue about racism. And now, you know, government programs and all that, there are all sorts of things we can do to help people who may be struggling. But, but here's the bigger problem to me. It's the cultural opinions of people um, that, keep, that keep racism raging within our hearts. Um, when I was growing up, I had an extended family member who was deeply racist and said things and made jokes uh, about about black people that, that I, I tried to forget them. Uh, I don't remember a lot of the details, but I remember it was part, it was just part of who he was. And, and sometimes that gets handed down like eye color and hair color, these cultural opinions that, that come from this, this racism that can live within us. And, and, and it continues today. It just does. I've got a friend, a, a, fr a friend of mine who happens to be black. And uh, after the, uh, the tragedy surrounding George Floyd, uh, I was talking to him one day. And I said, help me to understand what's going on. And he said, let me tell you what happened to me today, Larry. He said, I'd I was going to the gym. I stopped at Weigel's to get a sports drink. And he said, I went to the front door and there was a, an older white woman who was coming toward the door as well. And he said, I could hear the voice of my father telling me, you hold the door for that lady. So he said, I held the door open for her to go in first. 
And she looked at me and she just looked down and stopped. And he said, you know, that wasn't my first rodeo. I've been through that. So I knew what had to be done. I just went in and let the door close. That was the easiest thing to do. And then she opened the door and came in. And I guess he read my face and he said, and he, he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, Larry, it's every day. It's every day. And, and you know, it's not just persons of color that get these cultural opinions uh, that can be very, very limiting. It's, it's, it's other people. Um, you know, those people could be any people. I went to, when I was in seminary, one of my colleagues was serving a little church as he was going to school. And he wanted to start an AA group at this little church. And the people in this little church said, no, we don't want to do that. We don't want those people in our church. It's like, those people, what do you mean like doctors and lawyers and accountants and teachers and plumbers and construction workers and moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas? What do you mean? Those people, those people are you and me. They're us. But it's so easy for us to categorize people. People we categorize, by the way, are people Jesus died for and they are dying to break free of the cultural stereotypes that hem them in. We've got to keep that in front of us. One of my friends is a recovering addict. And he said, you know, Larry, you can always see it when people start to understand where you come from and who you've been and, and some of that baggage that you take with you. And you can see it in their eyes. They don't say it, but you can see it. Oh, 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 you're an addict. Oh, oh, you're an alcoholic. But, but it doesn't just stop there. You know, oh, oh, you're... You're, you deal with depression. Oh, oh, you have anxiety disorder or bi bipolar disorder. Or, oh, you or some of your family has dementia. Or, oh, you're obese. Or, oh, you're poor. Or, oh, you're this. Or, oh, you're that. And, oh, my goodness, the categories just keep going. And the odds are we're in one of those categories to somebody. Whether it's black persons or Hispanic persons or, or Asian persons or homeless persons or Democrat persons or Republican persons, you know, there are lots of people who don't think and act and speak the same way we do, but, but we cannot consider them less than because we don't understand. We can't do that. Jesus didn't do that. He left a pretty clear model for us. And if you're in one of those dozens of categories, just know that Jesus doesn't play that game. Jesus doesn't look at you in categories and see a cultural misfit. Jesus looks at you in love and sees hidden potential. That's what he saw in that woman at the well. Not a cultural barrier hidden potential. All right, let's read a little further. Let's pick up with verse nine. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. This is big. It was about the sixth hour. That would be noon. Hold that thought. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said, will you give me a drink? The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And by the way, I left out this little parenthesis. Whenever he asked her to give a drink, he said, uh, it says his disciples had gone into town to buy food. My guess is Jesus had said, here, take this 20 and go to Hardy's, get us some biscuits. Because he didn't want them to be there, to be standing in the background going, Jesus, are you going to talk to the Samaritan woman in public? Are you crazy? He didn't want to have to deal with that. He just wanted to focus on her. And so he did. Now, hold on to that fact that it was noon. That's important. There's, there's a popular interpretation that arises from this story, and I think it's very valid, that the woman was by herself at the well for a good reason. In the traditions of Middle Eastern communities, the women did chores together. They would meet together, for instance, to gather water, and they would catch up on each other's lives and that sort of thing. And they would usually go at the time of day when it wasn't hot because it was very physical work uh, to bring the water back home. So there really isn't much reason for John to have noted that it was noon or the sixth hour, as this translation says, unless he wanted us to understand that this woman was there at noon when no one else would be there on purpose. You know, she was probably tired of hearing it, all the yammering, all the opinions, these personal opinions about her. Yes, they're cultural opinions, but there are personal opinions that can hurt us. 
then the story goes on. Jesus um, had, um, had told her about this living water that he could provide for her. And let me pick up here. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will get thirsty and I have to keep coming here to draw water. And he told her, this is, this is good. Go back to your husband. Go back and, and tell your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you have now is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. My guess is this is what she heard from the other women in the village. That's why she didn't go to the well at the cool of the morning or in the cool of the evening because she didn't want to hear all that again and again. The difference is when Jesus told her about it, he didn't do it to judge her. He did it to acknowledge that he knew all that, still loved her, still wanted to help her live into her full potential and get past these things that were holding her back. I think it's wonderful that she had an opinion of him too. Um, and here it is. If she were to write a peer review of him for her supervised ministry group, she would write, um, haughty, insensitive Jewish man imposing his will on me. Uh, back in verse 12, um, where is that? Back in verse 12. She says, whenever, whenever he says, I can, I can give you this living water, she says, are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself and also his sons and his flocks and herds? In other words, she's like, who do you think you are, Jesus? Oh, she, should, she could have shut him down right there. And that would have been that with her personal opinion. But she didn't. She kept herself open to the possibility of who he could be. Because she did that, she ran right into the potential to realize who she could be. I love that. So here's something I want to say, and I want you to take this deeply, if you will, please. Don't give anyone except Jesus the authority to define your destiny. Don't give anyone except Jesus the authority to define your destiny because people will. Sometimes it's out of misunderstanding. Sometimes, I don't know, um, it may be out of manipulation. Sometimes it may be out of just pure meanness. But people will try to limit our destiny. Don't do it. Now, we've talked about cultural opinions and personal opinions. Let's wrap up right here. What, should, what do you think Jesus' opinion of you is? He has one, you know. What do you think his opinion of you might be? I know. Uh, I looked through a lot of scriptures to come at this, and I decided to, to take a little scripture out of um, Luke 19. I'm not going to read it. Just to remind you the story of Zacchaeus. You ever hear that story? Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He wasn't very tall. He was a tax collector. That meant everybody hated him right? And he was the one Jesus was coming through his town. Zacchaeus heard and he climbed a tree so he could see Jesus. Well, there were certainly lots of cultural and personal opinions about him. In fact, it says in the story that the people said, he's going into the home of a sinner. They said that specifically about Zacchaeus. They hated him. You, you know, they hated him. They hated tax collectors. But Jesus said, I'm going to your house, Zacchaeus, and today salvation is coming to you and everyone in your household. And then he wraps it up by saying this, I have come to seek and save the lost. That's his opinion of you. We've all been lost at one time or another, and we still get lost sometimes. Jesus came. He left heaven knowing that his life here would end on a cross, or at least his, his physical life before the resurrection. That chapter of his life would end on the cross, and he still came to look for you and to save you. That's his opinion of you. Oh my gosh, he loves you so much. He loves me so much. Let that sink in. In the beginning of John's gospel, it says, through him, all things were made. Jesus made this earth. Jesus was there as part of the Trinity. He made you. He made me. Let that sink in. It was through Jesus, the living word of God, that you're even here on this planet right now. And he came to die 
so that you could live. He knows you better than anyone else. He knows you better than yourself. No one has the right to hold an opinion that can hold you back. People can have opinions about you, but no one has the right to cause you to be less than who you were created to be. No one has that right. Only Jesus has that kind of authority, and he thinks you're terrific. He thinks you're wonderful. He doesn't want to limit you. So my prayer is that as we move forward from today, you will focus more closely on Jesus' voice and let him drown out some of these voices that can limit you from becoming your full potential. And let, let, him, let him say to you and hear him saying to you, my child, I love you. My child, hear my voice. Follow me. I live for you. I died for you. I live for you again. Won't you live in me and then live up to all that you were created to be? Love is the key. Jesus has it. Will you open your heart to him? I pray so. Let us pray. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the love that seeks us out. This love that, that has an opinion of us that we could never fathom. We, we could never believe that you love us as much as you do. So almighty God, help us to simply take it for truth and to allow the voice of Jesus to drown out the voices that would hold us back so that we may grow to become all that you've called us to be. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.